Good evening, everyone. Thanks for listening to another Bible study here at Marion Street Church of Christ. We want to welcome you all here, and we want to thank you for listening. Let's open up to the book of Ezra. That's where we are going to be tonight, uh, the book of Ezra and our Old Testaments. We, as you are logging in, we started a brand new Bible study last Sunday, and so you can always... Uh, exit out of this video if you wish and go watch the introduction if you missed that uh, last Sunday and then you can come back to this uh, video to start getting into the book of Ezra but that is up to you on how you want to do that uh, we concluded our big picture of the Bible study last year in 2020 so starting in 2021 we're starting some new quarters of classes and that means what we are doing is we're going along with our theme as a congregation, and our theme this year is down but not out. We all had a down year, but as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, uh, we are hard pressed, but we are not destroyed. And so that's where we got our theme this year, down but not out. And so what we are going to do as a Bible study for Sunday nights here on Facebook Live is we're going to look at the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah perfectly encompass that theme of down but not out, and uh, we talked a little bit about that last week when we introduced these two books. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. We're going to go over chapters 1 and 2 this evening, so that's where we're going to spend all of our time tonight, chapters 1 and 2. Uh, and, and I'll just give you some real quick things to think about uh, tonight. Um, I know it's kind of hard since we're not using PowerPoint on here and we're not making these classes very difficult uh, since so many of you are at home and so many of you are trying to deal with kids at dinner time and all those fun things. Um, so what I typically do, this is just me on how I teach because I know we, we do have several people who aren't members at Marion Street who don't know me personally. They're watching uh, and we want to thank you for that and thank you for sharing uh, this video as well. But the way I typically teach books, it's been a while since I've taught a book. I, I really like to do topical studies that are pretty uh, applicable and, and practical for our everyday living, but it's good to also look at these individual books. I don't go verse by verse. Uh, we just don't have the time to do that. This study, I believe, let me look at my schedule right here, we have 13 studies. We've already done one, so that means 12 studies left to get through 13 chapters in Nehemiah and 10 chapters in Ezra, so 23 chapters. So that puts us at just about two chapters per study. And it's impossible to go verse by verse and be able to conclude everything. Uh, this is just me. I know different people teach different ways. The reason I don't go verse by verse is because I feel like when I'm teaching an adult class, that an adult can, if they're really interested, they could take the time to read verse by verse if they choose to do so. My goal when I teach a class is to look at the overall theme of what's being talked about through the course of the book. And what how I do that is more thought by thought. I'll look at bigger sections of text. I'll get some of the thoughts out there. If I do think there's a key verse or two in some of these sections, we'll go over those. I'll read a few verses. But this won't be a verse-by-verse -verse study. My hope is to get a better understanding of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, but also have a better understanding of how they apply to our lives. And so that's our goal for this study. So again, we're going to start in Ezra chapter 1 and chapter 2, uh, and that's where we will conclude our study this evening as well. So remember what we talked about last week. Last week when we looked at our introduction, we reminded ourselves that the book of Ezra and Nehemiah are, are written after the Jews were able to leave their Babylonian captivity and enter back into Jerusalem. And they were given certain tasks. Here we're going to see in Ezra that they were given a task of rebuilding the temple. And later in Nehemiah, they're going to rebuild the city and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, but uh, you have the children of Israel now returning from captivity and starting to rebuild their lives. And that's why we chose these books for Down But Not Out. Uh, the, the children of Israel had been taken into captivity uh, by the Babylon, the Babylonians, by, by, by Babylon. And uh, they had been there for at least 70 years. And so the southern tribes of Judah, Judah and Benjamin, were taken into captivity by Babylon and that's where they were held. And now here you start in verse 1. It gives us some context, uh, some historical context. It says, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. So here we are in the very first year of Persian control. 
Uh, Cyrus was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah to, uh, to really lead the people to freedom. He was a very messianic character. Not that he was the Messiah, but he was messianic in, in kind of pointing the way for Jesus. Cyrus and Persia would free the people physically from Babylon. Uh, Jesus would free the people from sin. And so when Isaiah prophesies about Cyrus in, in uh, his prophecy, uh, there's very messianic undertones there. But uh, So here you have Cyrus. Cyrus is the leader of and, and be the beginning at the beginning of Persia, and so uh, he defeats Babylon pretty soundly and establishes himself as uh, as as king of Persia and king over all the Babylonian uh, captives, which means the children of Israel now belong to Persia. This is also um, something that was prophesied by Isaiah by Jeremiah. So prophecies are now starting to come true hundreds of years later. But he says something here, and he says by an order of decree, that's what Persians did. They would decree something, they would write it down, and then under their law it would become official and nothing can take it back, or a proclamation as well. But it says this in verse 1, it says, Now in the first year of Cyrus king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom, and put it in writing, saying, and he goes on to say that the, the king of Persia was going to, uh, the God of heaven called him to release the children of Israel and let them return to Jerusalem. And whoever was among his people uh, can go back, uh, as it says in verse 3. And they were to rebuild the house of the Lord, it says in verse 3. That the God of Israel, he is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor and at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So this is important. It's important historically, but it's also important spiritually. Uh, where you have this historical leader, this world leader, who, who is not denied in, in world history. You have a mention here in scripture, and, and you, you're starting to see world history and, and Bible history match up where you have this world leader, this great king of Persia, who was able, he sent out this proclamation saying, the children of Israel can go home and he can't, they can go and I want them to rebuild their temple. And he says several interesting things here. He, he calls God, um, uh, the, the God of Israel, he is God who is in Jerusalem. Uh, he, he refers to that God called him to do this, that God stirred up his spirit. Uh, there's some debate on what that means, but most likely what that means is the fact that if you remember Daniel was taken into Babylonian captivity at a young age. Uh, through the book of Daniel, you see him transition into uh, a, a position of a, a authority, and although he was still a slave and a captive, he had held a position of authority and importance in the Babylonian uh, Empire. He would hold on to that in the Persian Empire. And there's a lot of people who suggest that Daniel talked to Cyrus about God. And in his first year, as, as Daniel found favor with Cyrus, which we have other stories from Daniel uh, in, in the Persian Empire as well, uh, when he found favor with Cyrus, Daniel found, uh, or Daniel told Cyrus these stories and Cyrus felt compelled to let Daniel's people return home to rebuild their temple because that's the God, um, that's the God of, of Daniel and they needed to do what they felt like they needed to do based on their God's law. So that's, that's a probable, uh, I think a probable outcome of what happened historically. Um, and, and, and I, I don't know. There's some people who debate God spoke to Cyrus in a dream. Uh, God told Cyrus. He stirred up his spirit. More than likely, Daniel had something to do with this, and, and Daniel made it known to King Cyrus about their God. Uh, the, the, the Persians were polytheistic, which means they had many gods. Uh, so uh, why not include God and, and the God of the Israelites in, in with their gods? And he kind of says that's where... Uh, the God who is in Jerusalem in verse 3. Uh, the, 
most likely Cyrus felt like that's where he was. That's where he he lived. Like you have the water god that lives in the water, and you know things like that. Well, God, the God of Israel lives in Jerusalem, so you need to go rebuild his house if that's what your people need to do. And so that's what he allows them to do. So to Cyrus, this was probably no big deal. The God God needs this house, but to the Israelites, this was a huge deal. Because the Israelites were finally allowed to go back home after over 70 years in captivity. Now, some would last even longer in captivity. They would make their trek back later. Um, But the first round of people are now allowed to go back to Jerusalem. And when they got to Jerusalem, Cyrus, in his proclamation, said the surrounding people need to support them in rebuilding their temple. They they need to give them good uh, the goods and the cattle and silver and gold, everything that they need to be a people again. They need it, and they need your support. And so this was huge for the children of Israel because this is now the beginning of them coming back, that they were down and out. They were knocked out of the historical picture. They were knocked out of the spiritual picture. They were in captivity. Their city, their temple left in ruins, and now they're able to start clawing their way back out of the pit, so to speak, and into relevance again. So this is the first step. Cyrus allows them to take that first step. Uh, And then in verses 5 and following, you have uh, the offerings being made and you have um, have a a little list here. We talked about that last week. Ezra likes to deal in lists. Uh, Very, very methodical, very exact on numbers. Like I said in in verse 9, there's 29 duplicates. Well, you know, why not just round that up to 30? Well, Ezra wanted to be exact, and, and he is the author. He loves these lists, and this is the exact number. Uh, but uh, you have uh, the articles, the temple articles, the holy vessels, some of your versions might say, being restored back to the children of Israel. In fact, it even says in verse 7 that Nebuchadnezzar, who was king of Babylon when he took over Jerusalem, he took all the holy items of the temple, and he put them in other temples of their own gods. Uh, but Nebuch- or I'm sorry, but Cyrus, king of Persia, allows the Israelites to take all their belongings back and put them back into their temple once it's done uh, being rebuilt. And so uh, that's that's you know again uh, you were you start seeing them just one step closer. Not only are they able to start coming back as a physical people and back into their homeland. They're now starting to come back as a spiritual people. They're going to go rebuild their temple. Not only that, they get to replenish their temple with the original artifacts that were taken from their temple. So you start seeing them just take one step further here. Now, in chapter 2, it talks about the people who are actually returning home. Uh, There is also a list in Nehemiah. They are vaguely different. A few names are either changed or or added. Um, there's, There's not much cause for concern for these lists being a little different. Uh, one could be, uh, one explanation could be that this was the list that was taken in, in Persia before they left to go back to Jerusalem, while Nehemiah's was after they returned to Jerusalem. Um, but there's, there's just, there's no way to tell uh, exactly. But you do have another list here, that as they were leaving Babylon uh, and going back to Jerusalem, uh, that there is a list. And, and first are some of the leaders that are listed. Uh, it says in verse 2, these came with Zerubbabel, with Jeshua, Nehemiah, uh, Sariah, Reliah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispar, Bigvi, Rehum, and Banna. Those were some of the, the leaders that were helping, the Jewish leaders that were helping lead the people back. Uh, important few things to, to, to think about. Uh, Zerubbabel uh, was the the popular leader of the the time. Uh, he's the grandson of uh, Jehoiachin, which was one of the last kings of, of Israel, or or I'm sorry, of Judah. And so um, he was very popular in Babylon because of his royal status and his royal line. Uh, but now he's leading the, the the children of Israel back home, along with some of these these others. Uh, Mordecai is is probably not the Mordecai of Esther, although Esther does come in this time period. Uh, but Mordecai is probably not the the same Mordecai. Just in in case you're wondering. Um, and then you have this list of numbers, another list. And again, this is something that I feel like you can maybe read on your own time if you're interested in it. But you get just all these numbers of the, the sons of certain families that were coming back. 
And not to make light of this, I think it's very important uh, because what you see in these numbers are souls, are people of God who now God was allowing to return to the promised land. And that's not something to be taken lightly. You know, sometimes we look at these lists and we say, well, I can't pronounce these names and it's a lot of numbers and I don't care. Well, I understand it because we can't pronounce these names and it is a lot of numbers and does it really matter? Well, yes and no. Not that you need to know every name and, 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 and be able to pronounce every name, but these are important because these are names that God chose to put in his book. And with these names are names of, of men and their families who were able to return home. And, and that's fascinating because, again, where they had been for so long in, in Babylon, you know, that was a death sentence to be captured by Babylon. And here they are, they're able to return home. To me, that's a lot like sin, that, that we have a death sentence when we participate in sin, yet God allows us to return home. Our name can be written in the book of life when we come to Jesus and we're baptized for the forgiveness of our, our sins. And so uh, I understand that these names are boring and the numbers don't make any sense, but to us it should mean something because just like these people were able to return home, our name will be written in the book of life, Lord willing, and we will be able to return home. And, and, and so there's a parallel there and it's not to be, it's not to be taken lightly. Uh, you also see priests returning. Uh, you see Levites returning. Of course, those were needed to uh, run the temple and to, to uh, properly worship. Uh, you also have, I think this is interesting, just if you, you care about these kinds of things, in verse 41 of chapter 2, the singers of the sons of Asaph. Uh, the sons of Asaph are, are, are listed quite often in the book of Psalms as being authors of the Psalms. Uh, and so you have 128 sons of Asaph uh, returning to, to Jerusalem as well. Uh, so uh, I just, I think that's interesting uh, that you just, you get another connection here. These aren't just random people, the sons of Asaph is in Psalms. Uh, they are children of Israel who, who lived through this time period. And, and uh, maybe as you go back and read some of their Psalms, you could see their turmoil being in captivity, but you could see their praise returning home. Uh, so maybe that will help you in your studies uh, later as, as well. Uh, you uh, again, you just you kind of go through these these chap this chapter and you just see more names. Uh, so we're not going to read them all, but the point still stands that these are names uh, returning home uh, and, and finally able to to uh, to uh, have their have their rightful place in, in Jerusalem. Uh, you also have uh, a list of, of a few people, um, some of the sons of priests that could not be verified. Uh, this is all, I think, interesting because you, you start getting into this, um, you know, historically speaking, they kept records uh, of all their families and their, their lineage, uh, but with their temple being destroyed and their way of life being destroyed in Jerusalem, some of those things were, were lost. So it says in verse 62, they, they searched among their ancestral registration, but they could not be located. Therefore, they were considered unclean and excluded from the priesthood. Um, they were not going to take any chances. Just because someone claimed they were from the line of a priest, uh, if we can't find it, we're not going to take any chances. Our worship is to God. We need, we're going to follow his law. And his law said only certain people could serve in the capacity of, of priest. And if we can't verify that, we're not taking a chance. Uh, I think that's an important lesson in, in sin. Um, that There's a lot of times we take a chance with sin and when we hope for the best outcome, well, maybe we shouldn't hope for the best. Maybe we should just stay away from sin. Um, but maybe that's another lesson for, for another time. Uh, also gets into uh, these kind of final numbers. The whole assembly numbered 42,360 in, in verse 64. Um, they also had male and female servants that were 7,337 in verse 65. Uh, they had 200 singing men and women. They had 736 horses, 245 mules, 435 camels, 6,720 donkeys, uh, and, and then it says, it goes on to say that when some of the heads of the father's households, when they arrived at the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, offered willingly for the house of God to restore it to its foundation. Um, why is all that important? Again, we kind of read those numbers and you, do we care about the, the servants? Do we care about the animals? Uh, well, yeah, we should, because this shows again, just one more step back into these people becoming a people. Uh, they weren't just returning with nothing. They were, they were returning now with, uh, with servants. They were returning, I mean, they were servants. They were slaves in, in Babylon. And now they're returning with servants and they're returning with, with animals, with livestock. They could start their lives again. They could start 
the with the crops. They could start on their farms. They could start uh, going back to their old houses, and 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 their lives were going to start being pieced back together again. Which is the whole point of our theme this year, kind of picking up the pieces. Uh, that's our Wednesday night Bible study here at Marion Street Church of Christ. Uh, so you see how this all goes together. And then you see that uh, they were, were donated to the treasury, had, had gold drachmas, it had silver minas, it had priestly garments, had everything they needed to, to really now get started. And that's where we find ourselves. And that's, it's kind of like an introduction 2.0 because uh, they're just getting started here in the first couple chapters. But it's so important because you saw a people who were dead, basically, now starting to come back to life, taking those first steps. And, and, and I want you to picture for, for just a moment because you, it gets lost in, I believe, what's happening here in some of these lists and the numbers and, and just the Bible, the way the Bible puts things. The actuality of these events gets lost sometimes. And so I want you to just picture for a moment. Um, and the best way I can illustrate this is, have you ever been away from your hometown for, for even just like a week? Have you ever gone on vacation for a week and then when you come back, uh, there's just something about coming home, right? And um, I, I remember, you know, th there were several occasions, but uh, in a house that Brooke and I used to live in here in town, a lot of construction was going on around us. And so we would be gone for a week, and when we come back, we'd be pulling up to the house, and we see the construction that went on during the week, and it's like, wow, so much has changed, even just one week, right? And and we like seeing the progress of the construction going on around us, and it's you, it's very noticeable when you are not driving by it every day, and it's only been a week. Can you imagine seventy plus years being away from Jerusalem, and when you left it? If you can imagine as they are being carried off, they're looking back and everything they know has been destroyed and, and laying in ruins. The temple is gone. The, the walls are, of the city are gone. Uh, everything that they know is gone. And yet here they are. Some of them were, were young children now able to come back. Some of them have only heard stories of the promised land. And now here they are and they're able to walk back in for the very first time. That's not something to be taken lightly. Just, and I want you to picture that for a moment, what was, going through their, what was going through their minds and what they were feeling. It must have been very emotional to come back and, and see what maybe some of them had already seen and known from their childhood, and some of them see it for the very first time. Can you imagine the stories of some of these, uh, some of these parents and grandparents telling their kids about the wonders of this great temple and this great city of Jerusalem uh, where David ruled, where Solomon ruled, and, and all these wonderful stories, and then they get there and it's laying in ruins must have been very emotional. But this is what the first step is. The first step is getting there. Once we get there and make the decision that this is where we want to go, we that's our very first step. And so I want you to think about your life for just a moment. I want you to think about where you are spiritually. Where do you want to go? You may have some, some grandiose plans of, of what you want your life to be like spiritually or physically or financially, whatever it is. Well, that's the end game. You have to take the first steps to get there. And so I want you to think about where do you want to go physically? Where do you want to go spiritually? Where do you want to go financially, emotionally, socially? And then figure out the first steps. How do you start the process? This was a long-awaited return for the children of Israel. And that was the first step. They just had to get back home. Now they're back home, and now the work can begin, but they couldn't start the work until they made the decision to go, until they were allowed to go in this instance, and then actually get there. And that's what I want you to think about, that especially spiritually, we have a long way to go to get home, get to our home in heaven. But our first steps start now. We have to be following God. We have to be following Jesus. We have to be following his way and give our lives to him. That's a lot of information, I know. And like I said, I don't go verse by verse. I kind of go thought by thought and try to pull out some things as we, we go along. But that's Ezra 1 and 2 for you. And that should already give us some things to think about and some things to, uh, to dwell on and pray about over the next week. And we're just going to build upon that as, as we go. Chapters 3 and 4, uh, you, you have the, the beginning of the work. So you have the next step. They're there now. They see the ruins. Now it's time to get to work, which I'm sure was an emotional thing as, as well. And then chapter 4 is going to talk about what happens when people try to stop us from our work, the outside influences, and we'll talk about that next week. 
I hope that this study helped you tonight. I hope you've uh, grown to appreciate Ezra and his story just a little bit deeper. Um, that's also something I think that's interesting growing up. I don't know why. I always just assumed Ezra was a girl when you think of Ezra. Uh, I, I don't know why I always thought that when I was a little boy. You hear the name Ezra and Esther, and they're, maybe they're just so similar. I thought Ezra was a girl, and I remember one time finding out Ezra was a boy that led people back to Jerusalem, and I thought, wow, that kind of changed my perspective on a lot of things. Um, so that's just something interesting is uh, about me there in the book of Ezra. Um, but uh, we're, we're going to get deeper into Ezra as we go on, and I hope that helps you this week. We look forward to seeing you, so many of you back on Wednesday for our Bible study. Again, uh, we will have in-person Bible study on Wednesday night. We will also be right here on Facebook Live. It won't be me. It will be some other people teaching the upstairs class. I'll be downstairs teaching an adult class, so you won't see my face on Wednesday night, but you will have an upstairs adult class to watch if you can't come in person. Hope you all continue to have a good week. Hope you all are safe and well, and we will see you all soon.